Hello and welcome to this week's Ask an Atheist. My name is Liz Cavell. I'm Associate Counsel for the Freedom From Religion Foundation. Our topic today is a case that was heard just yesterday by the U.S. Supreme Court. It's called Groff versus DeJoy, and it involves how far employers have to go to accommodate an employee's religion. As always, if you have questions about our topic today, you can drop them in the comments below, or you can send an email to askanatheist at ffrf.org. I am joined today remotely by my colleague, FFRF Senior Counsel, Patrick Elliott. Hi, Pat. Hi, glad to be with you. And uh, just for everyone else, we're gonna be breaking down you know, how the justices on the Supreme Court handled this case and how they seem to be treating uh, claims of religious privilege more broadly. Yeah, so um, before we get into how the Supreme Court argument went, Patrick and I listened to those arguments yesterday morning. Um, I'm gonna give our viewers some background on the case. So you may have read or heard about this case. It involves a United States postal uh, worker uh, named Louis Groff, and he, oh, that's Louis DeJoy. Mr. Groff, um, who is the petitioner in this case before the Supreme Court, he was a rural carrier associate with the U.S. Postal Service. And that job is basically a part-time worker who um, is hired in order to fill in for um, career mail service carriers on their scheduled days off. So it often involves uh, weekend and holiday work. So. Um, after the post office started delivering on Sundays with Amazon contracts in 2013, he told his employer, the post office, that he had to um, be excused from Sunday work because he had a strong religious um, belief that Sunday is the Sabbath, so he is a Sunday Sabbatarian, meaning he refused to work any part of any Sunday, not just mornings or for church attendance, but that um, Sunday was a day of rest. So in order to accommodate his religious practice, the post office um, tried some things like um, shift swapping and um, trying to avoid scheduling Groff on Sundays and um, was workable some of the time. But at one time, um, the rural post office station that he worked at was so small and had so few employees that it's it created a great deal of burdens on the operation of that post office. So at one time there were only two other employees. So every single Sunday, like including during the holiday season, there was only one other employee or and the postmaster of the station that were available to cover every single Sunday shift. And so it resulted in um, one worker quitting, one worker transferring, and one worker filing a union grievance. Um, so a lot of disruption. So the case is brought under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act. That's a statute that requires employers to give accommodations to employees whose religious practice conflicts with some rule of the workplace. Um, and employers have to do that unless doing so would create an undue hardship on the conduct of their business. And this case is about what does undue hardship require? Um, what does an employer have to show in terms of the hardship in order to refuse to provide a religious accommodation? So um, we want to share some clips from oral arguments. And the first clip we have is actually Justice Sotomayor kind of getting into some of these facts during questioning and laying out sort of the factual basis in the, um, in the case below as she's questioning the postal carrier, carrier's attorney. Um, and this is from C-SPAN. Here's a man who applied for a job where he has to work Saturdays, Sundays, and holidays. And he applies and he says, well, now I'm not working Sunday, and I'm not working religious holidays because that's consistent with me, with my, with my religion. And it's not an undue burden to force the employer to have to give other employees greater work or to, um, or to have to cover more days than it would normally have to cover, or to force people uh, who also have the same job title to work every holiday and every Sunday. You're saying that can't be an undue hardship. 
That's not our position because that's not the facts of this case, well, he, Your Honor. Where he was, a, he was an <clears throat> RCA. He was required to work Saturday, Sunday, and holidays. And now he doesn't want to work half the days he was hired to work. Well, a few important factual clarifications. First of all, when Mr. Groff was hired, there was no Sunday delivery. But that's a little bit beside the point. The position of an RCA at, is defined at JA 144 in the record as being a non-career employee who fills in for career employees whenever needed. It's not specific to Sundays and holidays. That's actually a different position within the Postal Service known as ARCs. That was Sunday and holidays. That was Sunday and holidays. Mr. Groff's position is filling in throughout the week uh, when, it, when another a career employee is absent. So he did not sign up for a job specific to Sundays and holidays. And we concede that would be a very different case. I actually thought that was pretty significant, that last sentence, um, where he conceded that um, uh, the, the sort of the essential sort of purpose of the job that you were hired for um, could factor in to like the reasonableness in a different case, because um, I, I think he was he was portraying the rural carrier associate job a little bit differently than the USPS advertises that job. Um, it, it is a job that um, is specifically filled in order to um, provide coverage for career mail carriers on scheduled days off. And so that is often going to be weekends and holidays. Um, there are additional positions that they use for um, additional coverage, but it is part of the RCA gig, at, at least now as the way USPS advertises it, um, to understand that you're going to work um, holidays and weekends. So uh, granted, that didn't include Sunday at the time that uh, he started before Amazon contracts were in the mix. But um, I do think that that was something that ju the just some of the justices found significant. And I think it was kind of a big deal, or it struck me when counsel sort of conceded that that fact would really make a big difference. Yeah, and <clears throat> I mean, maybe this is an overall theme, Liz, I don't know if you agree, but the what was said at argument by Groff's attorney is I think a pretty big departure from what they had been arguing in the case and what the briefs supporting their side were saying. Agree. Because, you know, they're coming in saying, well, that we really need, um, you know, to look at the facts. This is why we kind of had this clip that was a bit lengthy so people could understand some of the nuance here, because this isn't a normal postal carrier, which we all, you know, it, back in the day, they wouldn't deliver on Sundays. Now <laughs> we live in a different world where packages are a big part of postal delivery. And um, particularly in some of these rural areas, there's very few people that are available to deliver packages. So Groff was in those people that needed to cover Sundays and deliver packages on Sundays. But there's a little bit of concession, I think, being made, um, which is why we wanted to play this part. And and the other concession, Liz, that, that I think um, you know you had drafted an amicus brief for FFRF that that you know I had contributed to, and we filed this with the court, kind of in response to what Groff was arguing, but also what some of the other side, you know, there's other briefs coming in, and they're really pointing out, um, oh, it it doesn't matter that you know the burden you put on your coworkers. Um, you know, you know the fact that other people had to work Sundays to fill in for him was one of the pieces they are arguing, and so that that was what they were arguing in their brief. And then at argument, you see a little bit of a pullback. Oh, maybe maybe there would be some um, issues if coworkers, you know, had to continue um, to fill in. And you know, we we had kind of talked about, uh, you know, in our brief just. The idea of accommodating, um, you know, all sorts of different beliefs by uh, what people would claim is an issue. You know, I think it's an issue for secular workers, for workers who don't have that particular belief. They have to pick up the slack. Um, you know, so we're concerned. You know, I think we said FFRF was concerned, uh, especially concerned that the religious employee will make claims that they have a right to alter working relationships between themselves and coworkers, customers, or subordinates. So we were kind of looking out for the idea that. People can claim religion not just to take a day off or to take a prayer break, but they can claim it to say, I need to proselytize to my subordinates at work, or I need to hand out religious literature to customers. And th these are actual things that have happened before. We're not just uh, making that up. So I think that was helpful to be a part of our brief, um, which didn't factor as much into the argument, obviously, um, you know, obviously here. And then 
you know, we also talked in the brief about various areas where religious accommodations may end up come, come into play. It's not just those time off requests. In the past, uh, you know, people have used the religious exemptions for various workplace rules. Um, I think we have another quote from our brief, um, you know, talking about Title VII. It says, claims under Title VII do not just relate to work schedules, breaks, and workplace attire. They run the gamut of anything related to a religious belief or practice. This includes religious claims related to employees denigrating LGBTQ plus persons, ingesting controlled substances, proselytizing in the workplace, sharing opinions on abortion, transporting alcohol, and working with someone of the opposite sex. The list is endless and will continue to evolve over time. Um, so I, I think this was a helpful point to bring up is we're not just talking about those types of things like breaks. Um, though a lot of those examples were real life examples where there's been work workplace disputes. So uh, that's kind of what we wanted to highlight for the court. And I guess I'm a little relieved, Liz, I guess I'll get your take on this, that those aspects didn't come as much into play. This was a little bit more looking at kind of the time off scenarios. I don't know if you kind of picked up on that as well. I felt a little bit of a sigh of relief. Um, there's some problems, but I don't know if you felt the same way. Yeah, so my overall reactions were similar in that the, like my general cynicism about this court is such that like, that it's always a little bit of a relief, even if it's just, um, you know, play acting on the part of some of these conservative justices when they when their questioning reveals sort of a cautious approach. Because I think what's important to just state, and we kind of are alluding to this, but of course it's, it's sort of um, technical, is that this is a case that's all about Title VII of the Civil Rights Act. In other words, it's, it's just about the meaning of a statute, a law that was passed by Congress. It doesn't involve a constitutional issue. So where courts are interpreting what one of our constitutional rights means or what our religious rights are under the First Amendment, um, that's sort of a different context of, con of um, Supreme Court review. Here, the Supreme Court is just reviewing Title VII and that language, undue hardship, and they're considering, they're being asked by Groff and his attorneys to reconsider the seminal case that interpreted that part of Title VII, this part of Title VII, which was a case called TWA versus Hardison. Um, and one of the big beefs that lots of segments of society have had over the past five decades, because this case was in the 70s, um, that people have had a uh, beef people have had with the case is that the court used the words um, no more than a de minimis uh, cost to describe or to give sort of a a verbal effect to what is meant by undue hardship. And of course, there's sort of a disconnect between just the, the dictionary definition or connotation of undue hardship and more than de minimis, right? Like that doesn't seem to quite capture what the plain language of undue hardship might have meant. So, um, but what was being argued by the government, the Solicitor General, was actually you have to kind of look back at the past five decades of how the EEOC and the courts have interpreted Hardison and this and this undue hardship language. Um, and the truth is that actually, um, you know, it's it's more than just that de minimis language. This is it's not the situation that um, religious. Uh, employees are getting shut out of court left and right. And the, the reality is that religious employees are um, frequently awarded accommodations. Employers are frequently ordered uh, by courts to um, give effect to employees' religious accommodations. So it's not the case that this is a, um, that this, that the Hardison standard is, is creating problems and curtailing, you know, religious liberty. It's just that um, this particular plaintiff and the agenda of the plaintiff and the lawyer and the groups behind the plaintiff is to really expand and continue to expand the rights of conservative Christians. And one way of doing that is to blow open our laws with these big religious exemptions. So one of the big issues that keeps coming up with this Supreme Court, and it was present in this case, is when should the court overrule prior cases? And we know that this court has been very aggressive about overruling prior decisions. They overturned Roe versus Wade. 
Um, they have upended the Establishment Clause doctrine in other cases, including last year, uh, uh, finally overruling and putting the nail in the coffin of the Lemon Test. Um, and so that's a really big deal, especially here, where we're just talking about statutory construction. The court is supposed to be cautious. And we heard Justices Kagan and Jackson um, really like noticing and giving voice to that problem in oral arguments. Um, like, why should they overturn precedent where the question isn't a matter of constitutional interpretation? It is statutory construction. So let's listen to the clip here of Justice Jackson talking about that issue. With respect to the questions about the establish establishment clause and the shifting um, uh, views as to what the Constitution permits, is there any impediment to Congress's acting now? I mean, setting aside um, the fact that there may have been a, that there's been a change in terms of the court, presumably Congress knows that and could change the statute now, right? Uh, absolutely. Congress could change the statute now. And the question is just whether this court should place on Congress's shoulders the burdens of this court's error in Hardison. But, but well, that assumes that that's the reason why Congress picked uh, this particular test. But, I mean, isn't, isn't this a policy question at bottom for Congress? And I guess I'm a little worried about uh, the, the history of people um, going to Congress and the many, many bills, apparently, you know, Hardison has been on Congress's radar screen for a very long time, and they've never changed it. And I guess I'm concerned that, um, you know, a, a person could fail to get in Congress what they want with respect to changing the statutory standard, and then just come to the court and say, you give it to us. Why shouldn't we wait for Congress? Now that the uh, 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 you know, law has shifted, as Justice Alito pointed out. Why isn't this the opportunity for them to act? So Justice Jackson, yeah. like, really hit it on its head um, a little more politely than I would have, which is that exactly what's happening in this case is what she, you know, voiced her concerns over, which is Congress hasn't done this thing that the religious right really wants to see done uh, in the law. And so they're going to the court where they know they have um, an, an ideologically aligned uh, supermajority that is open to this argument. And they're asking them to, to do to Title VII what Congress has not done. And one of the things she's alluding to in that question there, um, a couple of things. One is that one of the things brought up by, by some of the, like, you know, uber activists, um, even in oral arguments, Justice Alito was pointing to, um, and, and Justice Roberts, the idea that, well, since Hardison happened in the 70s, the doctrine um, interpreting the Establishment Clause has changed so much. Um, and in other words, <laughs> we, the, the Roberts Court, have eviscerated the Establishment Clause. And so some of those concerns about um, Title VII n not being neutral, in other words, favoring religious employees that might have been motivated by the Establishment Clause, now that's not a concern anymore because we have, you know, just dismantled the Establishment Clause. So maybe that's why Congress hasn't acted for fear of running afoul of the Establishment Clause and we should step in and just do it. Um, but of course, what Justice Jackson is saying is, I think, I'm pretty sure Congress has noticed that the Supreme Court has been taken over by Christian nationalists, and yet they still haven't acted um, to do anything or to speak on this matter. Because again, this has been precedent in this Title VII employment law context for decades, from the 70s. So the other thing that she's pointing out is Congress has actually taken up this exact amendment that's that's being proposed by the plaintiff. The plaintiff is urging the court to adopt a definition of undue hardship that Congress has used in other legislation, like the um, Americans with Disabilities Act. So it's this more explicit definition of undue hardship that involves like a substantial cost. Um, and Justice Jackson is pointing out that Congress has actually taken up that exact amendment. It's been proposed in one or both houses of Congress multiple times 
over the past two decades in the 90s, in the early aughts, up until 2013. It's had bipartisan support, yet Congress has declined to ever pass um, those bills and amend Title VII exactly the way that the plaintiff is asking the court to do. And we pointed this out in our brief as well. Um, that is a strong uh, overstep. That is a very strong um, strident way for the court to enter this statutory construction space when Congress has complete authority over what Title VII says and means and has not done anything in this direction. Yeah, I think what you're hitting on, too, it's a really smart, like, line of questioning from, I guess, our side. You know, you're getting Justice Kagan, Justice Jackson kind of pushing back to the idea that, oh, you don't like how the statute is worded or how it had been interpreted for 50 years. Just the, obviously, let's just hit fast forward and this Supreme Court will give you what you want. Um, and so I think, I know this is a little bit of a dense conversation for some of our listeners and viewers, but it's important because it gets to the heart of what the court did last year, overruling Roe versus Wade, and what the court did in overruling basically the Establishment Clause precedent over the last 10 years is the it, the court needs to answer the question of when do we overrule our precedent? And it's a really bad reason to do it when it's a statute, because there's a way that statutes get fixed. And that's when you go, people change the law. Congress does that all the time. This is a popular fix, then that's what Congress should do. So I think it's a very smart line of questioning. It's not as exciting because it's not, you know, giving us the the ruling in a, you know, it's not, it's not using language that we're kind of used to about how should we treat somebody's religious privilege or how should we not. Um, you know, I, I think it's a, a good point made by those justices. And, and I guess just turning to one other part of the argument that I guess builds on this a little bit is Justice Alito, who you had referenced, who I think is the strongest advocate for overturning prior precedent when he wants to. Um, you know, he seemed um, to want to, he cited some uh, briefs by religious minorities, different groups that had filed briefs in this case, and basically saying, hey, these all these minorities think that this rule has been interpreted, you know, inappropriately. Um, and, and so we have a clip, and I just want people to pay attention to what, I guess, his, what I would call hostility to the Solicitor General um, during the questioning. We have amicus briefs here by many representatives of many minority religions, Muslims, Hindus, Orthodox Jews, Seventh-day Adventists, and they all say that that is just not true, and that Hardison has violated their right to religious liberty. Are they wrong? They don't want to, they, they, mis, they misunderstand what the lower courts and the EEOC has done? In our view, they're not accurately portraying how Hardison has actually played out in the lower courts and the substantial zone of protection for religious exercise that lower courts have recognized in light of Hardison. And if you are looking for more information to try to get a handle on the, the wealth of case law out there applying Hardison, I'd urge the court to consult the EEOC's compliance manual. We cite the manual uh, throughout our brief, and it provides, I think, an excellent overview of the types of accommodation claims that come up again and again and the types of lines that courts have drawn through this context-based approach, taking account of partisans' facts. And it's just incorrect to say that there is not a substantial amount of accommodation happening and that courts are just reflexively denying these claims. So That's all, not all, the all of these, all these groups, groups actually misunderstand the effect that Hardison has had on, on their members. Justice Alito, right. champion for minority religions, uh, as he is uh, so well known. Um, so there he is playing the straw man for, you know, look at all these conservative minority religious groups that have filed amicus briefs in support of the plaintiff's position. Um, are they all just wrong uh, about how, um, how curtailed their rights to religious accommodations are? And of course, the Solicitor General very clearly and forcefully answered that question, but he continued after that clip to, to badger her for an answer. Um, to that right. question. And I think I think that and she did a very good job. I think everybody's um, like one of the best advocates in the country, obviously, is the solicitor general. And one of the things she, I felt she was doing in this argument was bringing it back to what's what reality. You know, there's actual guidance from the EEOC and prior cases that have happened. Let's look at those. But I think the the Groff side kind of wants to live in the hypothetical. Isn't this bad? How you know how poorly religious minorities are going to be are being treated. And and Alito, I also kind of take umbrage at the idea of that all religious minorities are on one side of this 
um, you know, are on one side and they, they all agree as to this. It's like, oh, somebody filed a brief on behalf of some groups. Therefore, this is what their position is. And there can't be counter positions. Obviously, the non-religious that filed a brief on the other side, um, which which we don't get much credit for, not <laughs> that they would would care, but it's it was a little I guess it's it's good in the sense that the justices are actually kind of paying attention to what groups are talking about in briefs, saying, hey, we're concerned about how this will be applied. But uh, yeah, the straw man um, was definitely strong in terms of setting that up. And then I think just disregarding the answers continually to, uh, you know, here's how this has actually worked in practice and and bringing this to, um, you know, reality. What happens in the workplace when somebody says, I can't work, therefore my coworkers have to do everything else. Like there's actual people on the other end of that. A lot of them are a lot of them are religious too. It's not just non-religious people. Um, and so, Liz, I don't know what you thought about that. The the other uh, questions, kind of uh, justices, I think had even pointed out. Well, there are people who you know go to church on Sunday. They don't need all of Sunday off of work. But aren't they kind of impacted by this as well? If they now have to you know deliver packages late into the day or or otherwise pick up the slack. So this this isn't just hypotheticals. Like real people's lives are changed by how the court decides this. And so I, I at least felt that some of the justices were picking up on secular Americans and others. How do we, you know, how do we, what's fair, you know, really? And right. how do we balance that? And I agree with that. That's one of the things, Pat, you mentioned at the top that one of the kind of like broad impressions, and I agree with this, was that um, Groff, the petitioner's attorneys, seemed in some respects to try to moderate some of the arguments that were made in its briefing more in a more absolute fashion. So one of the things that I think fits into that category is I really think, and I, I think um, you could tell that the Solicitor General was also struck by this, um, that the way that the plaintiff's attorney argued about third party burdens was much more absolutist in its brief than it was before the court. So in its briefing, the way it framed the question presented to the court was basically um, asking the court to decide that third party burdens alone can never establish undue hardship. That is very absolutist um, and very you know, it was sort of annoying hearing so many, so much discussion about bright line rules because everyone understands um, that this is a very contextual area of law. Like every single one of these religious accommodation requests is occurring in the context of a different workplace with a different number of employees and a different size business. And so it's very case by case what's going to be reasonable, what's going to cause undue hardship. Um, so these big sweeping rules, categorical rules, don't really fit the situation. But in the briefing, I think there was much more of a hard line position taken by the petitioner Groff to say that um, Hardison inappropriately uh, allows for third party burdens to uh, inform the undue hardship analysis. And I think at oral argument, he, his attorney really backed away from that, saying, well, of course, um, burdens on third parties can be part of the analysis, but it has to rise to the level of a concrete um, cost or hardship. And so some of the justices were grappling with what that means. But I did think it was a little bit more of a cautious approach than we saw in the briefing. And I was really encouraged um, well, I was slightly encouraged that some of the conservative justices, most notably, I think, Justice Barrett and Justice Kavanaugh, were seemed to be really grappling with um, this issue of, of how much of a hardship it really can be to deal with effects on other, especially other employees and coworkers, um, and not just the concrete, you know, dollars and cents, but the concept of like morale and the problems that are caused in the workplace when um, major burdens and you know major changes to the um, terms of work for other employees are being affected by religious accommodation. So I'm not like totally bought into the idea that they will sign on to a cautious opinion because I've definitely been fooled before by their <laughs> impersonation of a measured ju jurist. Um, but at least that argument, they did seem to be presenting a lot of questions about um, 
and, and hard questions to Groff's attorney about um, the significance of third party burdens um, and how much hardship they can really cause to the conduct of a business. Yeah, and in the I guess in the, again in the more concrete way when the court was talking about it, I I felt and this is where we don't know what this opinion will look like and how the court will rule. So it could be bad that they actually do understand the dynamics and are still going to just give religious privilege to people <laughs> and make other people pick up the slack. But I felt like they at least and this is all just you know based on small amount of small sample that the justice is talking about Sundays for instance was helpful, like in the sense of hey, it's a day that kids aren't in school. Somebody might be going to their kid's soccer practice. Like they, there are, it's, it's the way our society lives right now is, oh, I can understand that a non-religious person wouldn't want to work on Sunday. Like they're not, they're not going to church. They're not engaging in religious practices, but they have off of work and they want to do family things or they want to go um, do recreational things. Like I like that they understood that. Like, I don't know, again, I don't know that that will mean that we all still have to, well, we better go deliver packages on Sunday or pick up the slack. But there was at least an understanding of like, oh, it's not all, um, you know, Saturday or Sunday is just a religious holiday for people and, and nobody does things. It's it's very much a recreational time, a family time for people, non-religious people and religious people. So I felt a little better about the court's understanding of how, you know, society works. Like, I don't always have that feeling when we listen to these arguments. So right. that helped. But we still were living, I think, as you mentioned, kind of in this theoretical world. And and I felt that maybe a summary of the argument was ultimately by Justice Sotomayor kind of talking about, you know, the just language of a test isn't going to resolve this. And so we have a clip of Justice Sotomayor kind of talking about the context specific. What's clear to me after all this discussion is that as much as we, some people might want to provide absolute clarity, there is none we can give, is there? Because That's it's all contextual. Yes. And to that end, there are going to be some cases where people are going to be unhappy with the court's result and others where they are happy. Um, the best we can do is do what Congress told us to do. Yeah, that I mean, that really did sum up a lot of the 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 broad problem with um, this case and, you know, it's sort of uh, its goal of of broadening Title seven in order to more, you know, robustly privilege religious employees. It's that, you know, the context of the case is just it. It's the court is just not the appropriate place um, for this policy decision to be borne out because this is something that is happening, like we said, in the real world, in these individual workplaces on a case by case basis. And when it does rise to the level of the courts or the EEOC getting involved or both, um, you know, th these cases are being resolved um, based on really specific facts and circumstances that don't lend themselves to categorical rules. And uh, very often they are um, ending in favor of uh, religious accommodation. So again, we don't have a crisis of um, religious employees being you know, shut out of the, the marketplace or shut out of their, their jobs and careers because they're unable to resolve these conflicts between religion and their work. Um, this is a, this is Title VII is a um, is a statutory scheme that by and large is working. Um, it's working in a way that is um, is or gives respect and you know gives favor to religious employees and helps them resolve these conflicts. And so upending all of these decades of employment law that has been built under this Title VII scheme, would just, you know, sow more chaos in a space where the court really shouldn't be acting anyway. Right. And I think, you know, one of the things that we've talked about that wasn't in the context of we're all just thinking about Sundays off, but there are a lot of other ways in the workplace that religious accommodations can play out. So one of our fears was, again, I kind of mentioned the, the proselytizing um, being a concern. And so far, the employers have done a pretty good job in terms of winning those cases. They think, it's wrong for a supervisor to be pushing religion on a subordinate. 
we run some legal risk if they do that. You know, we can get sued for religious discrimination. And so far, the balance has been pretty strong in favor of, you know, I think the, the employers have correctly been winning a lot of those cases, not all of them. But the concern here is if the court, you know, if the court changes the test and say, employers, you have to really, you know, there's a really rigorous proof to show that you're substantially burdened. Um, you know, you're going to have to show substantial costs. And we don't know what that will be. Um, that's going to tip the scales and employers are likely going to say, oh, well, I need to be the most accommodating and allow my employees to do things that are actually harmful to, you know, other people. So that that's one of the concerns we have. And I don't know, Liz, if you've it's so hard just from argument and from the briefing, but if you have an idea of what, how narrow might the court rule on this, I, I don't know if you have a take on that. Yeah, so you know me, I I don't wanna take a very like hopeful view of what's gonna happen because I do think it's not just, you know, my own conspiracy mindedness. It really is true that like this court um, has an ideological agenda. And so, you know, you look at who's behind this case, it's First Liberty Institute. It's one of the Christian legal um, outfits that is just fully committed to this project of priv privileging conservative Christians in our, in all areas of civil society and especially under the law. And this court is fully on board for that project and, uh, or, you know, a super majority of them is. And so um, I don't necessarily feel Pollyannish about, you know, like an actual m measured or cautious opinion. But I do think there at least were some reasons from oral arguments to think that um, possibly a majority of justices are looking for a way to... Um, deliver a more cautious opinion that's not going to undo the body of case law that has developed under Title VII for the past five decades. So I do think there's a possibility that there's a narrow decision that involves um, maybe Justices Kavanaugh and Barrett um, uh, coming or signing on to an opinion that sort of recognizes that the de minimis, more than de minimis language is problematic, but that doesn't overrule Hardison on its facts and therefore sort of start from scratch in terms of how we apply Title VII in the employment context. What do you think? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I think if they make a slight wording change, that could be the green light to all the other, you know, the one of the, uh, the attorneys for the, Groff in this case is First Liberty Institute, which is a Christian nationalist legal group. If the wording changes by the court and then people can then claim, oh, that has completely reshaped the law, it may be out of the court's hands for people to sue and to, to bring, you know, these types of claims. So I'm my overall impression was that the court wasn't really looking to completely upend employment law. So that's good. But uh, they may unintentionally do so if they say, oh, we mean substantial burden means the same as it means under the ADA. That may completely, you know, that may completely shift things. So I, 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 uh, I, I'm happier after the argument than I was before, but it's still, it's still a bit of a scary time, depending on how the court wants to treat this. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And this court is known for doing like, like secret, you know, sort of um, sleight of hand, do, you know, doing its damage by like sleight of hand. And I'm thinking about the masterpiece cake shop decision in 2018, which involved, right, like the bakery in Colorado that wanted to discriminate against same-sex couples in violation of state law. And I mean, that was a different court, right? That was when Kennedy was still on the court, RBG was still alive. But what the court did, like, wasn't sweeping. It didn't say, you know, you can violate anti-discrimination laws based on your religion, but it's still found in favor of the baker and sort of put all this um, kind of muddying of the waters into the legal question of how our anti-discrimination laws operate in, in the face of religious you know, pushback. And I think something similar could happen here if there's sort of this um, you know, halfway approach that is just kind of laying the groundwork for something more sweeping a few years down the road, which is what we're about to see in the in the civil rights anti-discrimination context this year. 
Yeah. And do I don't know if we have questions yet. This yeah. is Ask an Atheist. So if yep, people have yep, questions, yep. otherwise I've got <laughs> We've got a couple of questions. So let's let's um address these, Pat. So here's one. Oh, this is interesting. So would this ruling, and I would amend this to say, would a ruling in Groff's favor mean that mail carriers could potentially not deliver certain packages or to certain businesses based on their religious beliefs? For example, packages that are supposed to be delivered to Planned Parenthood. Could a, could a pro-life um, mail carrier not deliver certain packages? Sort of yeah, getting but, at, like, what about religious conduct? How will right. this affect those claims? This this is a great question. So somebody here knows what's up because yeah. these are some of the prior cases that have happened. Um, there have been cases by um, Muslim transportation truck drivers that did not want to deliver alcohol. And the court had to go through analysis as to whether, you know, could that be accommodated? Obviously, if you're driving truck for Budweiser, you know, you're not, that's not going to be something that could be accommodated, but maybe it could <laughs> be if you're a smaller employer. Um, and the other context is this has come up in cases and the courts have had to rule on is, Actually, law enforcement, there was a case where a law enforcement officer didn't want to guard and protect uh, an abortion clinic, you know, when there had been need to do so because there had been confrontations. And it came up that for whatever reason, the, the police department could sometimes transfer him or, or do whatever, but sometimes they couldn't. So these are like real cases where somebody has a religious belief, but then there's kind of some other view and do they have to accommodate? Under current law, I think that would be a huge problem for the post office because of all their other regulations about you don't necessarily know what's in a package unless it's <laughs> you know, flagged as hazardous. So this is not going to work. Right. But it it's it's it, within the realm of possibility that people could try to bring those claims if that door opens up a little wider. And usually that's gonna come up with, you know, things like alcohol, things connected to abortion clinics. I mean, these are actual disputes in the past that have happened. Right. And these are cases, right, that are that have happened in the past and that are concurrently being pressed uh, oftentimes by these same legal, you know, Christian nationalist legal groups that are pushing these cases at the Supreme Court. They are also building these cases in the lower courts. So one I'm thinking of that came up last night was um, a nurse that was fired from like a CVS pharmacy or clinic um, for refusing to dispense um, birth control in contravention of her religious beliefs. And they they adopted a policy that, um, this is interesting, Patrick, that religious accommodations could not be made um, that involve the essential function of the position. So dispensing medication is viewed as ass essential to the job of, you know, a pharmacist or whatever, a clinician there. And so... Um, they wouldn't provide accommodations that involved refusal to dispense um, certain medications. And so she is suing. Um, and other I, similar claims have been brought against pharmacies and hospital systems for similar um, uh, Title VII claims that involve employees that don't want to perform functions of the job that conflict with their religious beliefs. And that often involves... Um, Pro, you know, providing services or, you know, providing health care to actual patrons or patients of the business. And so, um, of course, all of that will be affected by a decision in this case. Right, right. So here's another one, Pat. <clears throat> this gets at, a, I think, an important issue that we could kind of clarify. If I claim my religion requires me to say not work on the second Wednesday following a full moon, would my employer have the right to ask what religion I am? So this gets it. And there's another question here. How can an employer di differentiate between sincerely held religious beliefs and a belief that's just being used to justify taking a day off? So let's take those two together and talk about like, what's the situ what's the status now for inquiring into sincerity or what the religious yeah. belief is? They can. So this is a, I mean, again, another very intelligent <laughs> question, I would say. The, so you do have to have a sincere religious belief. Um, so there are some things that probably wouldn't cat you know fit in that category, even if you had a moral belief or some other you know requirement. Um, so far, right now, courts and also the the employers defending usually don't press that issue very hard. They don't really look at oh I can't get a vaccine because of my religion. Well, you could look at well do you get other vaccines? Are you, you know, how are you other, do you use other products that were tested with fetal cell lines or things like that? <laughs> right now, there's no, um, there's very little 
pressure on that. But I think that's where we're headed is like we may have to get into a little bit of is this a sincere belief because people are claiming so many things like obviously the Sabbath is not a thing that's easily um, tested. But there is a case that I'm aware of where a it was actually somebody who was Jewish um, said that she couldn't work on Saturdays because because of the Sabbath. And then the employer actually looked at what she was doing on Saturdays and it was all sorts of other things that was like, well, you're you were really just claiming that because you wanted Saturdays off. So it's rare that the courts and the the employers look at that because it's usually not very fruitful and, and the courts are very much favorable to let's not inquire too hard into sincerity of belief. But it is an area I think that we're headed to look at because people I'm giving vaccines as the greatest example that so many people recently changed their opinion on vaccines, which you're allowed to do, but it seemed more of a political belief or just disagreement about wanting to do this thing rather than is it actually, you know, connected to your religion. So I think that's maybe where we're headed. Right. I agree with that. And um, I'll just say a final thought from a comment that we had that kind of ties that up is this court, this this ultra conservative kind of Christian supremacy um, supermajority that we have has we have seen that it has privileged uh, Christian litigants. Right. This this is not a contrary to Justice Alito's, you know, clever um, point at oral argument. This is a evangelical Christian um, litigant, right? This is not yet a minority uh, religious um, employee. So this court has continued to privilege these types of litigants um, in all of its work. And this case may not be different. They may find a way to um, broaden protections for religious employees, um, kind of to the detriment of, of sort of this the whole... Um, continuity of this body of law and, you know, employees and patrons of businesses everywhere. So we are going to be watching for an opinion uh, this summer, right, in this case. And of yep, course, by the end of June, yeah. we, we will we will have an answer on this case. And the other case we've we've talked about before is 303 Creative is the business owner who doesn't want to create websites for uh, gay or lesbian marriages. So both of those, both these religion cases will be decided by the end of June. Yeah. And so uh, watch this space for our analysis when those decisions come out. And we will revisit this then. Um, until then, that concludes Ask an Atheist for this week. Thank you so much for joining us. Be sure to check out FFRF's broadcast TV program, Free Thought Matters. Our guest this week is Ryan Burge, an author of the new book, 20 Myths About Politics and Religion in America. In this preview, he dismisses the myth about religiosity and old people. If you actually look at the data, people do not become more religious as they age. I looked at every, I, I broke the data into five-year birth cohorts, so like people born between 1940 and 1945, 1945 and 1950, all the way up to people born in the 1990s. And in every single birth cohort, there's a larger share of non-religious people today than there was in 2008. So it's every single birth cohort is less religious. It's not just young people. And people are, they're not becoming more religious as they age. Actually, they're becoming less religious as they age. You can watch Free Thought Matters on TV stations around the U.S. on Sunday mornings or on FFRF's YouTube and Facebook channels. And check out Free Thought Radio, FFRF's weekly radio show and podcast. To find out where to hear Free Thought Radio, visit FFRF.org slash radio. If you want more state church separation talk from the perspective of four women attorneys in the secular movement, movement, including myself, check out the We Dissent podcast in our latest episode, which drops next Wednesday. We're discussing court reform. Um, find us wherever you get podcasts and check us out on Facebook and Twitter or at we-dissent.org. And if you want more information about the Freedom From Religion Foundation, check out our website at ffrf.org. See you next time on Ask an Atheist.